so um, thank you and welcome everybody today to this session about which is really focusing on the needs of families, carers, friends of those who are supporting people with Lewy body dementia. So thank you to Jackie and Ashley for um, helping support this work through the Lewy Body Society and really lovely to see some of you join us today. Um, so this is a recorded session, but um, what really what we wanted to do today was talk through just some of the issues, the challenges, and some of the things actually that have worked for people in terms of managing, supporting people who are affected by this condition. Um, my name is Rachel Thompson, I'm the consultant admiral nurse, and um, Jackie introduced me earlier, but I'm funded by the Lou Body Society. And I've um, started in post in December last year, and since June have been supporting people, some families um, clinically who are caring for people, and also the people that they're they're supporting as well um, and what I'm very aware of is we are working and living in very unusual times aren't we at the moment and I was just saying before that I certainly the stories I hear is that people are really kind of starting to feel it I think we all felt it at the beginning um, but it's really starting to take its toll so I think in the context of people feeling very isolated perhaps not having the right support this kind of session I hope will be helpful just to air some of the kind of things that people have found in terms of what worked, what didn't work, and what they would have liked to have seen um, happen in terms of the support. We know as an organisation, Jackie and Ashley have done huge amounts of work that there's so much more to do to raise awareness of the needs of people with Lewy body dementia. It is different to other types of dementia and all of you I think probably on this call are very aware of that. Um, and so perhaps this is an opportunity to talk about why it's different really. So without further ado, I'd really just like to, I'm going to ask each of our panellists, so thank you so much for agreeing to take part today, just to share a little bit of their own experience in turn. Um, so I think if I can ask each of you, I'll come to you first Jack, if that's okay, if you can just introduce yourself and say, um, what your caring role experience was, who it was that you were supporting. Okay, so um, it was my dad that had a diagnosis of Lewy body dementia, and that was in 2008, 2007 stroke 2008. Um, he lived with Lewy body for about approximately two years. And like a lot of people, when he got his diagnosis, which he received from his GP, because at that time there was no memory clinic in Wigan. And he was fortunate, if, if you can use the word fortunate, to receive his diagnosis um, immediately from his GP. And he, because he never saw a psychiatrist, he was referred um, to an old age consultant um, who at that time, it was strange because he had other underlying medical conditions like he was partially sighted, he had a pacemaker and there was a regular conversation between his old age consultant and his heart consultant and in the end he was at, on no medication for his Lewy body dementia because it would have interfered too much with his other medication. And we got to crisis point because my mum was looking after him during the day and I was taking over at night after I'd done a full day's work as a business analyst. And he was admitted to a care home. It was a great care home. It was in that care home is now a butterfly scheme care home. Um, really, really, you know, brilliant staff who even like 12 years later are still support the Louis Body Society on social media and still in contact with, with us. Um, so that was really good. But we did get to crisis point um, where the head of social, the of social work team from the local council came and said, he's going into respite now because we literally couldn't move him. And within a, less than a week of being in the care home, he was up, he was walking about, he was walking down the corridor with no walking frame, 
unaided and it, it, you know it, it benefited him as as well as us so we could focus on the good on the better times with him i missed one day in 18 months of him being in a care home so i can really understand what people are going through at the moment with not being able to visit relatives because they would have been arresting me if I couldn't have visited. They really would have been arresting me. Yeah, thank and... you. Sorry, Rachel, were you going to I was say? going to say, thank, thank you, Jackie. I, if it's okay, we of might... Of course, yeah, sorry, like... I could go on forever. Yeah. Well, and I think a lot of people could. So, but thank you for sharing yeah. that. That's really, really helpful. Um, I think what I meant to stress beforehand is actually the uniqueness of everybody's situation. So every one of us in this room is very different. Every one person who's affected by dementia can be affected differently, but I think there are also some kind of commonalities and how it can feel. Um, but thank you for sharing your experience, Jackie. Um, so Heather, can I come to you next? If you could just introduce yourself and I think perhaps just a bit like Jackie, just say a little bit about the experience of getting the diagnosis and where you are at the moment, if that's okay. Okay, yeah. Well, hi and good morning, everyone. My name is Heather, and I'm currently supporting my partner, Chris. Um, and we have lived together for about four years, although we've been together for about 10 years. And um, Chris was diagnosed with Lewy body dementia in January of this year. Um, her sort of background history in, in terms of the dementia and everything is that um, she had three uh, strokes and uh, then she was diagnosed through the elderly care assessment team at the age of 60 with early onset vascular dementia and uh, from there um, she then was found to have um, Parkinson's disease. Initially, she had a tremor in her arm and initially that was put down to vascular Parkinism. Um, however, in 2017, um, after referral, she was picked up by the specialist Parkinson's nurse and was diagnosed with Parkinson's disease and put on some Parkinson's medication and that was really helpful and the support that we've had from the Parkinson's nurse has been really really good. In 2018 Chris noticed that she had lost her sense of taste and smell and uh, in <clears throat> excuse me and uh, after sort of three years of waiting to see a neurologist in January this year um, we saw the neurologist after a, a, a brain scan and uh, we were kind of expecting to just get the changes in her brain. But um, Chris was given a diagnosis of Lewy body dementia, which kind of came out of the blue for both of us. Um, Chris is very passionate about making a change in things. Um, she's very capable of, of talking for herself. I would never consider doing that and uh, she does a, gives a lot of talks um, does a lot of work on zoom now and um, that is fantastic because that that keeps her very active keeps her brain going and uh, there are some downsides to that with fatigue and other bits and pieces but kind of that's that's where we are at the moment is that okay thank you Heather. Yeah, that's lovely. Um, it sounds like the diagnosis was a bit of a shock at the time. Is that something mm. that, yeah. Yeah, both, di back. both diagnoses were, were quite a shock. I mean, Chris, at that time we were living apart and I was concerned about Chris because she would often say that, gosh, I feel a bit hungry. And then she would say, oh gosh, I've only had a bit of toast all day. And she was forgetting to take medication and stuff like that. So in some respects, Chris has said this herself, that 
kind of some of the things that were happening to her, she felt that she was going to be sort of mad that something wasn't right. So when her diagnosis came of early onset vascular dementia, although that was a shock at the age of 60, um, um, I think it kind of explained a lot of things for her. And um, certainly with the Lewy body um, diagnosis, we just weren't expecting it because Chris had had a, a recent brain scan and we were just going there expecting that we'd find out about the changes in the brain. So it was kind of, you know, we both were, we sort of both were, oh, what? Um, and the neurologist had said, because we, we had both asked, well, it, can you confirm this? And, and she explained that it was on the symptoms that Chris was having. Um, and yes, there had been some changes in the brain, but the main thing was the symptoms that she was having that, that to the neurologist that, that indicated that she had Lewy body dementia. Uh, but the only way it could be confirmed was on autopsy and neither of us were quite ready for that. Um, so as usual with these diagnoses, there was no signposting. We weren't told about the Lewy body society. We had to find out for ourselves. There was no, we weren't told about Admiral nurses or anything like that. So it was only through research that we found out uh, about Lewy body society and then, you know, Rachel and the Admiral nurses and both have been an amazing support to us because there's very little out there. Um, you know, you, we didn't have a follow-up appointment. We didn't really know what, what would happen or what to expect or what it all meant really. Mm. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, I can see a lot of people nodding, Heather. I think there's some shared experiences there, but mm. thank you, we'll come back to you if that's okay. Um, so Ashley, I'd like to come to you if that's okay next, if you'd like to share a little bit about who you were supporting in your experience of getting the diagnosis. Um, hi, um, it was my mother who had Lewy body disease and uh, dementia. It took, in, in 2000, she had a fall and just wasn't, wasn't quite right after that. Um, and, and I'm sure everyone's had this experience of, we thought she was having a little bit of trouble with her gait and, and we thought it was an, an old knee injury. And then she started just to behave strangely. Um, the hallucinations started probably about two years after the fall. Um, <clears throat> I, was, I, I, I live in England, my parents were living in the States. And so my care role was going back and forth every couple of months, I was not primary care. Um, but I, I'd go for a few weeks and then come back and then go for a few weeks. Um, my father looked after her with the help of AIDS at home. We were very, very lucky that we were able to provide care for her at home. Um, by the time that she was diagnosed in 2005, um, she, was, she was bedridden. She, she went into hospital with pneumonia and they said she wasn't gonna come out. Um, and she, from that point on for the next three years, she was she was bedridden um, and what can I say? Um, the hallucinations were the scariest thing yeah. um, because she, she, was, she was terribly distressed and she couldn't explain to us what it was she was saying. She, you know, she'd, she'd ask for help. She'd say, you know, just do it like a man. Um, just it, it, terribly, terribly frightening uh, um, for her and frustrating for us um, I'm 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 70 I was at university in the early 70s I, w I saw a lot of people drop acid I never took it myself because it was so scary to watch people um, freaking out on, on LSD and that that's what my mother's hallucinations reminded me mm -hmm. of um, yeah so we might come back to that Ashley because as we know hallucinations can be a very distressing feature for some people not everybody, I have to say, it's around 80%, we think, but um, when they happen, it's tough, isn't it? Um, you mentioned about getting the diagnosis in 2015, it, sorry, 2005. Did it, did it take a long, I mean, it sounded like it took a long time. It took a very long you... time. My, my father had her, had, took my mother to countless co consultants, neurologists, and, and, uh, and he eventually made the diagnosis. 
Uh, he, I, I was actually there at that particular consultation. I mean, it, it, and and you know, like like anybody else who's caring for somebody who's got this 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 disease, you want to find out as much as possible, even if you're not quite sure what it was. And yeah, you know, I, I watched when he he suggested neurologist twenty seven. Do you think it might be Louis body disease? And the, you know, and the doctor sort of sucked his teeth and said, Oh yeah, I think I think Louis, I think that's probably right. Um, but again, at that at this point, she was so ill, um, and she was terribly sensitive to any sort of medications her, her entire life. She was a teeny tiny person. And so um, the experiment with with the um, Parkinson's drugs, because she made the hallucinations worse. Um, mm -hmm. She couldn't she couldn't take um, uh, come, the words of gone uh, the Aricept or anything like that. They, they, right. It just didn't do it. And even things like teeny tiny doses of, of, of I think it was thiamine, um, uh, something that was was a vitamin she just she couldn't take anything and, and in the end when she was not on any drugs at all is when she was most comfortable okay so i might come back to that but thank you for sharing that ashley i think there's perhaps some people i think i saw alec nodding a little bit there so alec if it's okay i'm gonna come to you thank you ashley um and if you could just share similarly a little bit about who you're caring for and your experience of diagnosis. And I'm just going to put myself on uh, off Zoom because my, um, my battery is going. So but please carry on talking. I'll come back. Over to you, Alec. I'm obviously Alec. I care for my wife, Stephanie. Um, I mentioned earlier about the taste and the smell. Uh, Steph lost her sense of smell a good while ago. I can't even remember when. Um, I think that probably was one of the first signs. Um, minor things over the years, but it wasn't until 2013 that she had real health issues. <clears throat> Basically, headaches, migraines, and she was diagnosed as having anxiety and depression. Um, and she was treated for it. She went to a clinic, the Priory, uh, quite expensive clinic, but initially we thought they were doing okay. She came out, she went back in, she came out, she went back in. Um, we were getting a bit concerned because it seemed to be gradually going downhill rather than improving. Um, we asked for a second opinion. Um, we got another psychiatrist to look at Steph and her immediate impression was that Steph had Parkinson's. Um, we got a referral to Salford Royal. And it's at Salford Royal that Steph was diagnosed with Lewy bodies. And that was 2016. So it took three years of false diagnosis before we had an idea of what it was. But we didn't really know what it was. All we knew was it was dementia. Well, that was the word, the dementia, and that was a shock. But it was a, a relief to find out at last what had been causing Steph's issues. Um, then, as has been said, it's up to yourself. The, the only way you find out about Lewy body dementia is to look it up. Nobody tells you about it. Then you suddenly find you've not just got dementia. Steph's got Parkinson's as well. So it's a double whammy, you know, <sighs> horrible, horrible. Um, and, and since then, it's just been gradually downhill. And now Steph needs looking after 24 seven. Um, and it's not gonna get better. Uh, it's just a horrible, bloody disease, horrible. Yeah. Thank you, Alec, I think. You highlighted some. Rachel, can I there quickly about the hallucinations? Mm -hmm. One small plus has been that Steph had the hallucinations, but it was only for a short period. I'm going to say short period, a couple of years maybe. Um, and that wasn't a pleasant time. Um, she saw <laughs> things, she imagined things. I was poisoning her, I was beating her up. It was, it was very unpleasant and I, it's, heart goes out to anyone who's suffering with continual 
hallucinations. It's a living nightmare. Yeah, yeah. So, Alec, we again, we might come back to that because we're going to be talking about some of the symptoms that can be particularly challenging in Lewy body dementia. But I think the points that you've all raised were felt like the difficulties around getting the diagnosis, the, the delay because people weren't recognising the symptoms, the lack of kind of clarity about who does the diagnosis sometimes and then after you've got the diagnosis. I hear a lot actually people saying sometimes it's, it can be a relief. You know, people do say I couldn't work out, Heather, you said, you know, Christmas then I thought there was something wrong with me. I thought I was going mad and things like loss of smell and taste. Jackie and Alec, you both mentioned that. Not something you would associate. Um, and it's probably worth just mentioning, actually, dementia always, I think, classically, we first think about memory, don't we? And the difference with Lewy body dementia is that memory isn't always the first thing that changes that it is more things like visual perceptual things and some of what we call the autonomic symptoms. But um, but thank you, Alec. Um, and, you know, you're in a, still in a difficult position. So there may be some other people in similar positions on the call as well. So, but Jackie, I think um, if it's okay, if I'm gonna come back to you now and I'm gonna combine the questions of just thinking about when you're thinking about your dad, if you could just say what you, for you and your mom, what were the most challenging symptoms, but also what helped? Okay, so I think the the most, just saying about hallucinations, my dad did, that, that was the kind of key feature and the key reason for getting the diagnosis was the hallucinations. But I think because he was partially sighted and had been from the age of two, the hallucinations didn't necessarily distress him. They did occasionally, um, but, but the majority of the time they didn't because he would normally see things like men cutting trees down in the garden or animals or, or people visiting and things like that. So the hallucinations weren't necessarily distressing. I think the, the most challenging times were at night when he'd gone to bed and it might have been 10 o'clock and half an hour later he would be putting his coat on and saying I've been to bed I've been to sleep I'm going for a walk no it's 10 o'clock at night and those were the I think the lack of sleep I remember once going to work and I'd had two hours sleep all night I literally couldn't drive to work. I had to get a taxi from Wigan to Manchester and do a day's work and come back. That complete lack of, of sleep. He could go 48 hours without sleeping. And if he was sat in a chair and didn't want to move, he would turn himself into a dead weight so that you wouldn't move him. And he, would, he knew everything that was happening because he would say, I'm losing my mind. So he actually understood. And another relative had Alzheimer's and he was totally different. He did not understand anything that was happening. So he knew everybody all through his journey. Um, I think the kind of things that helped were when he had those moments of complete clarity. Because we always say that with Lewy body dementia, it's like flicking a light switch. And he would have moments of complete clarity and he would joke and he would ask for chocolate or, you know, it, you know, it, I think that once my mum opened a, a bounty bar and she gave him half of it and he held his hand out and said, where's the other half? You get two, you get two parts in a bounty. You know, those those kind of moments, I think, um, were the, the bits that you kind of hold on to and taking him out in the car, sitting at the top of um, Purple Hill or Rivington with an ice cream, just those simple things um, where he would sit in the car smiling. So. Thank you. Jackie, you mentioned before about the care home and actually you had a good experience, which is nice to hear, isn't it? Because sometimes yeah. you hear negative things about care homes. 
What what was it that worked for you and your mom in terms of your dad moving to a care home? What was what was positive about that? I think it was it was positive because they were doing the personal care that we that we had been doing. Um, we went every we went every day. I went every day. We took him out in the car at weekends. We were treated by the care home as as kind of one of the family, if you, if you like. I would go most nights as well, straight from work. And the first thing that they would ask when I walk in is, have you eaten? And they would go to the kitchen and go and get me something to eat if I hadn't eaten. Yeah, because they knew otherwise I wouldn't be eating till nine o'clock that night. Yeah, and I would be up, I would be up at six to go to work the day after. Um, so th they were just so kind of understanding, um, you know, and the amount of activities that were that were held, you know, even just simple things like the, the saying, oh, it's Friday, everybody's going to have fish and chips and send him out to a local chippy to get fish and chips and bring in them in um, so that the residents could eat the fish and chips out of the paper, you know, just to, to try and make things as normal as possible you know if, if that is possible but yeah just um and just the feeling that they wanted to collaborate with relatives and, and for it to be kind of recognizing that the curring role doesn't stop when a relative goes in a curl yeah really good point thank you jackie really nice to hear a positive story and i think it is everybody's different aren't they Make yeah of course they about, are yeah about a care home is a, is a really big decision um, and some people choose not to and equally that's a big decision but I think it's interesting. I, I, think, because, I think as well Rachel because it was taken out of our hands. Right. Because we got to crisis point and the social work manager said he's going into a care home today. So my advice to people would be don't get to crisis point. Okay. We'll because the decisions are taken out of your hands if, if you do yeah but okay thank you thanks jackie um so heather i'm gonna keep to the order if um that's okay um so just a little bit about some of the symptoms that you and chris have kind of found difficult or or more challenging and what what's helped um yeah i, th I think one of the most challenging things and difficult things for me is the the change in personality chris has always been one of the most placid people i've ever known in my life always very patient always very placid um and that has changed quite dramatically um chris has got huge anxiety levels um socially we, it's difficult for Chris because if you're in with a group of people, she gets sensory overload. Um, so if people are very loud or there's lots of different conversations going on, um, you and I might be on three conversations hence, but Chris is still trying to process conversation number one. So that, that makes her quite... Um, lacking in confidence in social uh, gatherings. So that has affected our social life. Um, not obviously through the lockdown, but out with the lockdown. So I find that really difficult because it's almost like our retirement is being robbed um, because this was not how either of us saw our retirement together. Um, you know, we, we were going to be, we'd worked hard all our lives, like everyone. Um, and we were going to have, you know, we were going to go on a tour of the country in our caravan and things like that. And it kind of almost feels like part of that's been robbed from us. Um, I, I struggle with the impulse buying, which is connected with the Parkinson's. Um, and very often if something's on offer, um, Chris will buy up a lot of it because it's on offer. So I struggle with that sometimes. We're kind of running out of room in the cupboards. 
Um, but the, that's quite a minor thing. Um, the restless legs, both of us really struggle with that. Chris, because of the pain of it. Me, because it's distressing to see someone you love suffering in that way when there's, there's very little can be done. Um, and it starts from quite early evening and it's the most awful thing. Uh, it's awful for Chris and it's awful for me because I, you know, I, I can't do anything about it. Um, the, the other things that come with it, the anxiety, the anger, the frustration, um, and, you know, the, the, the lack of confidence in a lot of areas, uh, the impulse buying, the computer use, um, those are all quite minor. And the thing that I find really helpful um, is that the time that we've had with yourself, Rachel, that has been a huge support to both of us because it has really helped me come up with strategies to try and not just react um, and have a bit more understanding of how frustrating and scary it must be for Chris. Because as Chris see people further down the line, you know, the, the thought of that could be her at some point in the future must be quite a scary thing. Um, you know, it, it, it's difficult for me, but I'm not looking at my future in the sense of that's how she could be. She may not be like that, but it's kind of a scary thing really. It's kind of like getting a glimpse into your own future which none of us really want to do, otherwise we'd be turning tail in and running off the other way. Um, so the things that we found really helpful are the support that we've got from peer support, uh, like-minded people, um, because you can always get lots of ideas from each other. Um, the, the, the practical support, the knowledge, the knowledge that the Lewy Body Society has, the clinical experience that Rachel has um, and, you know, such lovely people as well. Other carers in a peer support is always very helpful. Um, so th those are the things that, you know, that we found helpful. And we both try and sort of look on the positives as much as we can. And we're quite blessed because we're in the early part of Chris's journey. So we're just very thankful for all the things that we do have, really. Thank you, Heather. Um, that gave us a really broad view, actually. Interesting, all the differences, isn't it, already about different um, symptoms that people experience. So um, thank you for that. Um, Ashley, I'm going to come to you if that's OK. So same question, things. And actually, you were caring going backwards and forwards, but actually sometimes that brings its own challenges as well, doesn't it? So things that you found most difficult and perhaps anything that did really help you and your family. Well, I think, I think the frustration um, about not being able to do anything. And, and my father, my, my parents had been married 65 years when my mother died. Um, so they'd been married 60 years when she got sick. Um, and he was used to making things better, better for her. For her, she, he was—he was that sort of guy. He—he he he, he just loved taking care of people, and he couldn't do this. This was one thing he couldn't do, and the frustration you know, was was enormous. Um, so that was that was a problem. Um, being not not being there, there was the guilt, but that goes with any degree of caring. I've discovered it doesn't matter if you're full time care or if you're part time care. It just you're always going to feel guilty. Um, so that was. That was difficult. Uh, I, I turned my frustration into the Lewy Body Society because when, when the diagnosis did come, my thought was, well, when I get back home, I want to support whatever charity that there is. And I discovered that there wasn't one. And I got in touch with Ian McKeith, who was the name that then always came up if you Google Lewy Body Dementia. And, and he helped me set up the Lewy Body Society. So I channeled my frustration. Um, what, what I, I must say is that in 2011, my father started to decline. Um, and <clears throat> in 2016, he collapsed and I, I went to the States to look after him for three years. It was his heart, but he did get vascular dementia with it. And I found that just so much easier to deal with. Um, it, it, because it was just, it was just less complicated. 
complicated. Um, the, the most difficult thing is, and it's this way with any dementia or any terminal illness, is just seeing somebody love um, disappear pixel by pixel, um, just fade. Yeah. So I don't it's know if I your question. <laughs> no, it's okay. I'm just thinking. I mean, you talked a little bit about the frustration and the, you know, your dad not being able to make your mum better, which I think is a lot on the guilt. Actually, that's a huge thing for a lot of people. I know your mum and dad, your parents were over in America, but what what support, if any, was helpful at the time? What what did there make a difference? There was support. There, there was really no support aside from this team of absolutely wonderful aides that my dad employed, um, who were just they looked after my mother as though she was their mother. Um, but there really wasn't any support. Nobody, uh, I, I, well, by the time I learned about the Lewy Body Dementia Association um, is when I was starting the Lewy Body Society. And the, the support that they offered carers groups was not really um, what we needed. No, we had no support. We mm -hmm. had no support. We were pioneers. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, and amazing how you've channeled your energy um... Actually, I think that's pretty, pretty admirable and pretty unique. Well, really. so, it was not how to do it. And then, you know, it, it was just, it, it was the right, it, it happened at the right time. And, and yeah. so, uh, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Um, so, Alec, I'm going to come to you now, if that's okay, with the same question. So things that perhaps have been and maybe still are challenging, but, but also what, what support have you found that's been helpful or what has helped? I suppose that the worst was the, the hallucinations and the accusations. Um, but glad to say, as I say, that was for a short period. Um, the rest of it's everything so gradual. Um, you read up <coughs> all the symptoms, the possible symptoms. Um, it gives you some preparation. But actually, physically dealing with things, that's when it hits home, you know, when Steph can't do things for herself, slowly I help until I'm taking over with the, the washing, I have to wash her, shower her. Um, it's all gradual things, it's, it's just not fair on Steph. Um, incontinence. Her feet, she doesn't feed herself too well, I have to encourage her to eat now. It's a little, you know, she's been chipped away over the years from what was Steph, you know, to what is now Steph. And it's, you deal with it, but it's, I don't know, you just have to put up with it. And mm. You do your best, you know. Um, just wish this bloody disease didn't exist. It's, mm -hmm. uh, uh, yeah, uh, as for help, um, yeah, respite. Highly recommend respite for everybody. You know, um, daycare centres, carers coming in, uh, Steph goes away for a week or two weeks at a care home where we have a break. And it's not just for me, it's as much for Steph seeing carers is good for her and um, going to the daycare centre which is very limited at the moment um, but she's still got access to it and it's just that socialisation um, because she's at the stage now as I say where I'm doing everything for her basically but it's just nice that she has other people to see and talk to and um, one of the sorry things is the way friends disappear. And I don't belittle them for it. It's, it is, it, they remember Steph as she was, and you find it too difficult to see her. Uh, I'll stop at that and put on a great job. No, thank, thank you, Alec. Cause, and you touched on very sensitively some real things that people talk about that sense of loss you know at a stage where Steph has changed obviously a lot hasn't she and you're doing a lot of support at home which is incredible actually um 
But it was interesting to hear about what you're saying about other people occasionally like getting that support that the importance of respite both for both of you um and i would absolutely concur with that is that i hear so many families saying continually we must keep going we must keep going and jackie i know you got to a crisis point but actually accepting help is tough sometimes um but it is the right thing to do and i it is tricky at the moment but um but that real sense of loss Alec, um, is of, of who the person was when you're at a later stage. It's tough. It's tough. So, Alec, you did mention, I think, by email that you kind of joined, somebody before mentioned about peer support, and you mentioned about um, a Facebook group. I know they're mostly kind of American, aren't they? And actually, you touched on the Lewy Body Disease Association, which is the American version but can you Alec, can you just say a little bit about the Facebook and peer support and meeting other people in the same position has that been helpful? Yes we have carers groups in Cheshire East um, we have zoom meetings but to be honest the face-to-face the -face meetings are better with the, the peer group within Cheshire East um, and sadly a lot of the people that I did meet face to face, don't attend the Zoom meetings. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure what's happened to them. And it's, it's worrying that they perhaps don't have the contact now. Um, a recent one I've come across, mainly an American one, um, is the Louis Body Support Group on Facebook. Louis Body Support Group. It's all the posts are from people that either suffer with the illness or care for people with the illness. And it's, it's a big, big help to me just reading about other people. You know, I think I've had a bad time. I'll go on the post and I think, crikey, this person here, unbelievable. You know, the people on there, whether they've got it or they're caring for people with it, they're so brave, brilliant people, you know, and it just, it does help. It does help you. And I would recommend anyone on here to have a look at the Louis Body Support Group uh, the posts are wonderful. They're sad. Wonderful, though. Wonderful. None of this stuff existed, you know, when, when my journey started. It would have been really very helpful um, to have to, to have plugged in, but there was nothing at that point. And, and I don't, I certainly wasn't on Facebook back in you know, 2005. <laughs> I'm not <Yeah>. on now. <laughs> The world has changed, hasn't it? And particularly at the moment. But, it, would have been, um, it would have been so helpful. Yeah, yeah. But really good point. I think um, it's tricky at the moment, isn't it? With, with the lockdown and people not being able to see each other face to face. But I think in the absence of that, there are other things around. So um, the importance of peer support, I, I would absolutely, and a lot of the evidence does say it's important. Um, just so you don't feel quite so isolated, I think. Um, I, there is also something that some people I'm telling um, about, uh, about the, the lady called Esther Boyd, who set up something called Louis Bodies, um, who I've put a couple of people in contact with. And I think different people get support from different things, don't they? So having a range. And I think, Jackie, we're trying to pull together, aren't we, uh, a range of resources as well that we can... Yeah, Rachel, Esther's on the call at the moment. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean... Um, as everybody knows, um, we are a, we are a small charity. It's myself, it's Ashley, and the trustees. Um, so we are limited in what we can do. Um, our focus is around raising awareness, providing people with the information um, that they don't get given on diagnosis um, and funding research. Yeah. We have looked. In just to put some of Alex's stuff into context or Alex's comments into context for us, um, we, we've looked at um, support groups um, online, but for us as a registered charity, the amount of policing, if that's the right word, that we would have to do of these types of groups, we don't have the capacity to do that. Um, it would be a full-time job for a person to kind of look at these groups um, to make sure that we're, people were being given the correct advice, especially from a medical point of view. 
So what we have tried to do is to introduce these types of sessions um, to give people the option to join um, if they can. Um, we're recording them um, and if anybody's not looked at our YouTube channel, uh, please take a look because all these recordings will be on the YouTube um, channel. Um, we're now doing a monthly newsletter. Our second newsletter went out at the beginning of November. Um, there'll be a third one going out um, in December. And we're trying to share as much information um, in those newsletters um, as possible. If anybody has a particular topic that they would like to discuss, and maybe we do a full Zoom session just on nothing but hallucinations, yeah? Um, we are open to um, listening to what you want, and please just drop us a message on Facebook, um, on, on Twitter, or um, just, just drop us an email and at the end of the year, we will be doing a full list of events, you know, even for when we were all out of lockdown, um, we will continue with these sessions um, and we will try and cover off all the kind of subjects that you want to, he to hear about. Okay. Um, Chris, did, Chris and Rachel did a fabulous session last week at the UK Dementia Conference. Um, and we will make sure that that recorded session again is put on our YouTube channel. Um, because, you know, you need to hear from people like Chris, from people like Rachel um, to, to get that lived experience. Um, so we'll make sure everything's um, put on there. Thanks, Rachel. No, thank you, Jackie. You've summarised that quite well. So I'm conscious of the time. It's 12 o'clock. But um, Jackie, are we OK? Just to, just to carry on. Very yeah, because yeah, we started a bit late. So actually, really, I was just to round it up. I was going to ask each of you if you had one message to give to other people about your experience of being a carer, whether it be to another carer or somebody with dementia or a professional, what might that be? So, um, Jackie, I'm going to come to you first, if that's OK. So what would be your message to others? My message would be ask for help. Because my mum died last year and she, di she didn't have dementia, but she died at the age of um, 93 um, with an undiagnosed lung problem. Um, it takes a lot for a carer to pick the phone up or to ask for help. I asked for help to my local council last year to the helpline. The response that I got, I literally just burst out into tears on the phone because it was, it's your choice that you're a carer. And these are their words, not mine. It's your choice that you're a carer. Why, why, do you, why, do you need, why do you need respites? What do you want us to do? Yeah. So even though my mum didn't have dementia, there was a lot of it. She was bedridden, yeah? Um, and we were caring for her at home. That is not what a carer wants to hear when you pick up the phone. It took a lot for me to pick that phone up, a lot. And my local carer's centre, the local carer's trust wanted to put in a complaint. So I just hope that nobody else actually speaks to that person on the telephone. So ask for help, do not get to crisis point. And for strong carers, it, you know, it does take a lot to pick that phone up. And I wasn't taking my own advice that I give out to other carers that contact the society. Yeah. That's it, Rachel. Thank you, Jackie. So something about asking for help, but get some some people behind you that might yeah. and support you. So yeah, thank you. Um, Heather, what might be your message to other people? Try and surround yourself with positive people. Um, a lot of the things that 
we live with can be very negative and detrimental to our uh, physical and mental health. So it's really important to, to try and make sure that you link in with as much supportive people as you can. And my other piece of advice is do whatever you can outdoors in nature, because that really helps. Even when it's raining, Heather. <laughs> Even when it's raining, just get those wet proofs on. Yeah, lovely. Just sometimes walking out into the garden can be good, can't it? So, yeah. Thank you. Good advice. Um, Ashley, your turn. What will be your message? Stop beating yourself up. Um, yeah. That you're doing the best you can, and 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 you're doing what is right at the time, and. Um, just stop, stop beating yourself up. And the, the other advice, and I don't know, you know whether this applies to anybody else, but do be prepared to accept collateral damage. Um, my, my marriage didn't, didn't survive my mother's illness and a subsequent long-term relationship didn't survive my father's illness. So do be prepared for collateral damage. I hope it doesn't happen to anybody. Yeah, yeah. Important message, but I perhaps found in a somebody that all of your all of your emotional energy goes into that yeah yeah and perhaps even more important about keeping the people who can support you close well, yeah making sure that, that you have people around you who can support you yeah 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 keeping connected i think even virtually as well feels at the important so um alex just had to leave a minute so um, so, but some really important messages, I think, aren't there, about keeping connected, trying to be positive, a really nice message. It is, I often say to people about, you know, the things that we can't control sometimes. Um, so focus on the things that you can control and, you know, don't try and do it by yourself, I think. It's, um... Alec, are you okay? Do you want to, you've got a message, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Find some time for yourself. Yeah. Uh, just a few minutes here and there. Just give yourself a break. I mean, I've got two dogs and they keep me saying, walking the dogs. Just have some time for yourself. And just remember, you'll make mistakes. You'll get frustrated. Um, but don't blame your loved one. They can't help it. Just do your best. We're only human. Yeah. Can, I, can I just have a, a quick point? Touchy subject. Uh, I spoke to, well, I emailed you about this Friday, I think, um, on the Louis Body Support Group. One of the posts was from a lady whose husband had died a week or so ago. Um, he made arrangements that when he died, he would donate his brain. And it got me thinking now, Steph's not in a position to make that decision. Uh, I can make it for her and I've spoken to her family and we agree that it's the right thing to do and that she would have made that decision had she thought about it. And if anyone out there, you know, if you can make that decision for your loved one or ask your loved one to consider it, please do, because it might just be that little bit that will help in this fight against this horrible illness. Yeah. I'm going to add an amen to that. I, I'm on the computer. Yes, it is a very, very good thing to do. Donate your brain. I'm going to donate my brain. I hope it's yeah. going to be control. Yeah, thank you, Ashley. So, Jackie, I'm going to hand over back over to you. Um, thank you for a really important point, Alec. I've put you on mute, sorry, because it sounded like your, <laughs> your dogs were kicking off. <laughs> Is everything okay? Yeah, it was just Steph wondering. I just had to make sure she doesn't go near the stairs. Oh, of course. Yeah. No, thank you. And thank you for taking the time out, Alec, because it's not easy, I know. Um, so, Jackie, I, I, I was just looking at some of the... Were there any things in the chat box that we needed to pick up? Um, the look. Whilst um, Jackie's just having a little look, Alec, you made you did raise a really important point, and Ashley, um, you know, it's research is hugely important, and as the Louisville Society is funded and is funding research, but there are ways that you can register to donate your brain for research. 
Um, so Louisville Society is very connected with uh, joint dementia research, which actually anybody can join. You don't have to have dementia. In fact, actually, certainly as family members, um, I've registered as well because it's just a way of contributing towards finding out more. Um, and there aren't enough people, interestingly, with Lewy body dementia, really, we don't think representative. So, Jackie, I'm going to, do you want to add anything? Yeah, to that? so um, Joint Dementia Research, which is an NHS England um, initiative, um, you don't, as, as Rachel's just said, you don't have to be living with dementia to join. Um, they're equally looking for healthy participants. But people living with Lewy body dementia, there's only 188 people in the whole of England that are registered to take part in to take part in research, which is just you know at such a low number. And research doesn't necessarily mean drug trials. It can it can mean care home research. It can mean anything for healthy participants. It can mean completing an online form maybe once a year so that your cognitive decline, which happens naturally as you get older, um, is monitored. There's just so many research opportunities. Alzheimer's Research UK developed an app that you can put on your smartphone called See Heroes Quest. And I think it's something like three minutes on that app gives the researchers something like six hours of research material. I know people that are even giving the phone to the grandchildren and the grandchildren are playing with the app. Um, you know, it's, it, there's, there's all possibilities for people of all ages and all abilities um, to take part, um, to take part in research. Um, I think if people are looking at the, pos the option of donating brains, um, it's something that needs to be done sooner rather than later because we get contacted sometimes by people after a relative have died saying we want to donate the brain. It's not possible at that point. There's a lot of kind of pre-work, if you like, that's done before. Um, so registration needs to happen um, before. Um, just looking through the comments, Watch Rachel, there's no questions as such, there's just some, some comments. Um, and if anybody wants to follow up on any um, of the comments um, that, have been, that have been put in, um, another um, good reminder about getting power of attorney sorted sooner rather than um, later. People who've registered um, with Cardiff University, um, and you know we 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 understand that a lot of research has had to be stopped because of COVID um, and lockdown, but things will start to pick up again. The research has not gone away. If anything, it's more that it's more vitally important, I think, than ever to take part. Um, I just want to end with um, apologies again the problems that we've had in some people joining us this morning. Um, if you are registered for the session on the 1st of December, I will be checking the link and resending it out to everybody to make sure um, that, you can, that you can join that link. Um, it would be really good if you could, because it will be interesting to get, in layperson's terms, um, a perspective from one of our funded researchers. Um, and if you have got any suggestions on topics for Zoom sessions that you would like to see, please do let us know so that we can arrange for those um, to happen. Because if we get a long enough list, we can do them every week. They don't have to be every two weeks. Um, as I said, if you miss the start of this session, it's all been recorded um, and we'll just do a little bit of editing and then we will send it out um, we'll send out a link where you can get it probably on our YouTube channel. Thank you, Jackie. I'd just like to extend my great thanks to people who shared their stories. So, yes, thank you. Jackie, Ashley, Heather and Alec, thank you so much, because I think there's nothing like hearing about direct experience that really resonates. So thank you to all of you. I hope it's been a useful session. 
Thank you very much, everybody, and we hope to see you um, see you at the next sessions. Thank you. Mm -hmm.